Good morning and welcome to our fourth and final day of the Flukerville Seniors Conference. My name is Rob Fabian with Age of Central Texas and along with our partners over at the Flukerville Community Church, we are so glad that you decided to join us this morning. It's a beautiful, crisp fall day and we have got a wonderful presentation to wrap up this year's 2020 Flukerville Seniors Conference. Now, if you've been a part of our conferences in the past, you know that normally we host those in May during Older Americans Month. But of course, this year, things didn't quite work out for us. COVID had a completely different idea on what we would be able to do. So we haven't been able to have our in-person programming. But we've had so many great speakers prepared for this year that we didn't want to miss out on that opportunity to bring you all of this great information. So that's why we decided we would go virtual this year. Now, this is the first time that we have done our conference virtually, and we've learned quite a bit along the way. But so today, if we have a couple of little technical burps, please forgive us. We are still learning as we go. But we're very excited that you're here today because we've got a great topic talking about financial health and legal health. You know, all this week we've been talking about things affecting our health. On Tuesday, we talked about long-term care planning and how to plan financial health. On Wednesday, we talked about our physical health. We had a great session on the coronavirus and COVID-19. Yesterday, we talked about brain health, and then today we're going to talk about our legal health. All of our sessions are being recorded, and they're all being uploaded to YouTube, and I'll give you some information on that in just a few minutes. But first, I want to show you one very quick video. We are very grateful to have some wonderful sponsors this year who've helped underwrite our hard costs on bringing you this conference so that we can provide it for you for free. And one of those is today's session sponsor, which is WellBed. So we want to share this video with you. Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Youngblood, an internal medicine physician here at the WellMed Clinic in Pflugerville. I went to Texas A&M for medical school, and then I completed my medical training at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. I have been with WellMed for over two years now, and I truly cannot envision a better place to work or receive medical care. When Dr. George Rapier first founded WellMed back in 1990, he saw an enormous gap in medical care at the time. He saw an opportunity to start helping his patients stay healthy and reduce their hospital visits, rather than just waiting for patients to get sick before stepping in. Instead of only responding to symptoms after you become ill, WellMed is proactive with preventative care, helping our patients stay healthy. However, when and if you do become acutely ill or have a medical emergency, we do our very best to try to accommodate all of our patients with same day appointments, because we know that the earlier patients are seen and the earlier they're treated, the better they do, and the more likely they'll be to stay out of the hospital. If you do have an emergency after standard hours of care, we have extended hours clinics open where you'll be seen and cared for by a well-med doctor. This is important because they'll already have access to all of your medications and your medical history. So they'll be better equipped to care for you appropriately than would be an ER physician who doesn't know very much about your medical history. When the pandemic first started, WellMed went to extraordinary lengths to make sure that our patients that needed to be seen could do so safely. We quickly started using telemedicine platforms so you could be seen virtually from the comfort of your own home without the fear of exposure. If you didn't have the technology necessary to do a telemedicine visit, we have a service where they'll come drop off a tablet to your home so that you can be seen virtually on that tablet. And then once the visit's over, someone will come and pick that tablet up. If neither of those options are right for you, then we can always see you out in your car for one of our curbside visits. In short, we will do whatever we need and can do to help make sure that you get the best care you deserve. We're currently taking new patients and we hope that you'll let us care for you. 
Thank you, Dr. Youngblood. Thank you to all of our sponsors this week. We really appreciate your support. Before we get started with the presentation, I'm going to do just a little bit of housekeeping with you. Number one, as I mentioned, all of our sessions are being recorded. So if for any reason you have a technical issue on your side that your internet burps on you and you get knocked off, don't worry. We're we're going to upload this session to our YouTube channel. You can find that just by going to youtube.com and then search for Age of Central Texas. Also later today, we're going to send all of our participants the, the links for all four days worth of the session so that you'll have those as handy reference. So you'll be able to go back and watch them later or share them with your friends. When we sent you the reminder email for today, we also sent you a link to the program that we created for the conference. We hope that you'll take a look at that because it has a lot of really great information. Not only does it have the bios for all of our speakers and information from all of our sponsors, but we also curated a lot of great community resources for you within that program. So take a look at that because there's a lot of great information that can help you. Also later today, we're going to send you our survey for this week. We hope that you'll please fill out the survey. Just take a couple of minutes and that's all it'll take. It'll be electronic. But that information is very important to us because we are bringing you these conferences for you. We want you to have all the information that we can provide to you so that you can age successfully here in Central Texas. So when you fill out the survey, you tell us what it is that you want us to create for you for next year. Tell us what sessions you want, what topics are important to you right now. Tell us where you are in your journey so that for next year, we can create the most robust conference possible for you. And I guarantee you, we read every single one of those surveys and we take that information and utilize it to create next year's conferences. Finally, there's a chat feature right down here on your window. It looks like one of those thought bubbles from the comic strips. We want you to click on the chat feature and during today's presentation, ask your questions because again, this is for you. That is why we're doing this. We want to give you the opportunity to have all of your questions answered. And because we're talking about some really important topics today, if there's something you didn't quite understand or you have a question about your particular situation, ask those questions. Because while we have Keith today, we wanna to be able to answer them for you. Now, in the event that we run long today, that we have more questions than we can answer in our allotted time, because we did promise you that we were gonna end by 11.30, and we're gonna to hold to that because we know that your time is valuable. In the event that we have so many questions we can't answer them, don't worry, we're still going to answer your question. We will send you an email with a response. So ask those questions. This is your golden opportunity to have a lawyer right here that will answer your questions. So let's get started. We're very excited to have Keith Ludy with us today. He is with the Barnett and Ludy Law Firm. He graduated from St. Mary's Law School and then was licensed, uh, to, then he had his own practice for a while. He is licensed to practice in all of the state courts and his primary area of practice is in wills and estate planning. He served for six years as an attorney with the Chief Disciplinary Counsel's Office at the State Bar of Texas. And he helped with enforcing ethical rules that govern attorney licensure. He also served as an adjunct law professor for three and a half years with Virginia College in Austin. And he taught a variety of classes, including wills and estates, property law, criminal law, torts, and civil procedures. He also holds a PhD in clinical Christian counseling and he specializes in general estate planning and helping military veterans who may be eligible to receive the aid and attendance benefits. Keith is well versed in so many different areas of older adult law. Keith, we are so grateful that you're taking the time to join us today and share your knowledge. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Rob. I uh, appreciate being invited to speak uh, at the Fl uh, Pflugerville Seniors Conference and I know that there's gonna be a lot of questions at the end, and as Rob said, we will try to address as many questions as we can. Um, I do ask, having done a few of these seminars, if your question 
is uh, extremely personal in nature, such as, uh, you know, my father is doing this and what should I do for my father? Uh, those are the type of questions that because of attorney client privilege, we would want to meet with you privately. Uh, those are the kind of questions that we really cannot answer, you know, broadly. But um, as far as general framework type questions, uh, please feel free to utilize the, uh, the chat button and, and give us all the questions you want and we'll address them at the end. So, um, so we get a lot of people that come up to us when we do seminars um, and also come into our law office and they say, look, I know that I don't have my legal documents and my affairs in order, but I'm not really sure what I need. And so we start by telling people that there are five documents that we recommend for everybody um, and those five documents, if you have them, uh, you're, you're in pretty good shape. Now, there's a few other documents that you can add on to, uh, depending upon your circumstances. But I want to go first through the, through the five documents that we recommend for everybody, and why they're important, and, and what happens if, if you don't have them. So um, the first one, of course, is the one that everybody's heard about, and that is the last will and testament. Most people have heard about that. Uh, some people may have even had uh, to serve, uh, had, had a loved one pass away and had to take a last will and testament down in front of a court for something that's called probate. But a last will and testament is simply a document that allows you to determine who you want to receive your property when you die. Everybody when they're living has an estate. These are things that you can say that you own. And so when you die, the, loss, the law will determine um, who is going to obtain the things that you possess. And if you have a properly drafted last will and testament, then you get a voice in who gets those things. Um, a will can be very simple, it can be very complex. We've had people come in before and say, listen, here's my list of uh, 50 things and I want to be sure that my cousin gets the cuckoo clock and I want to be sure that my sister gets the coffee table. We also have people come in and, and the wills are very simple just saying look when I die give everything to my spouse and if my if my spouse you know, predeceases me then uh, leave it to my children in equal shares. That's actually to be honest the the most common thing that we see but a will also lets you determine um, who is going to be the one to go down in front of the court? Who's going to be the one to work with the, uh, with the lawyer uh, to make sure that this happens? And by, by the way, I mentioned the word probate. That simply means to prove. You hear that, ter that term all the time, probate. To prove means to take somebody's will down to the courthouse, show it to the judge, and prove to the judge that this is authentic that this is indeed the, uh, what the deceased person's wishes were. And so there are a lot of checks and balances in there that the court is looking for. Was the will properly witnessed? Uh, was it notarized? Did it meet all of the specifications? So um, a lot of times people will ask me, uh, at what age does somebody need a will? And my answer is, uh, well, under Texas law, you become an, a legal adult at the age of 18, of course. Uh, but do you need a will when you turn 18? Probably not, uh, unless you have inherited some type of property. Uh, I remember back when I was 18, I didn't have very much. And so uh, if, it, if you have somebody that age, they, they probably are not going to need a will. But about the time that people start getting married, buying houses, having children. That is a good time to start thinking about it. And the reason why is because, uh, although we don't like to think about tragedies happening to people at this stage of life, sometimes, unfortunately, they do. And if you are married and you purchase a house uh, with your spouse, there is a misconception that, well, if my spouse were to pass away, that I am now the 100% owner of the house. And that's, that's not true. Um, under Texas law, if you purchase a house together with your spouse, you own 50% of the house and your spouse owns 50% of the house. So if your spouse were to pass away, the house is now owned by you, 50%, same as before, 
and your spouse's 50% is now owned by your spouse's estate. And many people will um, find themselves in this circumstance, their spouse passes away, at some point they make a decision to sell the house, uh, either because they, they simply can't afford the mortgage payments or maybe it's too much house to handle or maybe it's just they, they don't want to be in the same house that they were there uh, with their spouse because it makes them sad. But they decide to sell and they find out when they, uh, when they get to the real estate office that, well, you don't have the ability to sell right now more than half of your house, the one half that you own. Uh, so they find themselves having to put the sale of that house on hold while they go through the probate process uh, to obtain the, the half of the house that their spouse used to own. Then they have the legal authority to then sell it. So um, a will is, uh, I, I sometimes have people ask me, is it required that you probate a will under Texas law? And the answer of course is no, uh, it's not required. You're not gonna have the court uh, calling you or the judge knocking on your door saying, when are you gonna probate that will? But if there is real estate involved, it is highly likely, unless you've taken some other steps, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit later on, that you are gonna have to go through the probate process. Another important reason to have a will, uh, even at this young age, is when people begin to start a family and they have children. Well, if you were to pass away, uh, presumably your spouse would be the one who would then raise your children. We would expect that, but what if you and your spouse are traveling together in the same vehicle and you go through the wrong intersection at the wrong moment and both of you are killed? If you don't have the proper uh, legal documents in place, then you are not gonna have a voice, uh, legally speaking, for who gets to raise your children. Um, otherwise, the, the court will decide, and it may not be a decision that you're happy with. So we encourage people uh, to, to get a will. The other reason uh, that a will is so important is because if a person does not have a will and they pass away, you've lost a lot of the predictability factor. And when I talk about predictability, I mean things like the, the price to get through probate, the timing, how long is it going to take to get through probate? Um, I can tell you this, now the, the COVID-19 has sort of changed the rules and we're just now getting back to where courts are opening up, uh, at least with Zoom court now. So for a while there, the courts were actually shut down. But the timing of it, if somebody passes away uh, and they have a will, a properly drafted will, you're probably here in Central Texas looking at about a three month window of time, give or take, uh, from the time when a person passes away until you go to court and, um, and actually are, are through with that part of uh, probating the will so that the distributions can begin. So if a person does not have a will, instead of doing uh, a regular probate where, where um, it's called a testate, if you die with a will, you are testate. If you die without a will, you're called intestate. Uh, so an intestate probate, you're looking at a significant amount of time. There are much, many more hoops that you need to jump through. And we, you could be looking at a year to a year and a half to get through the court system. Now, that can be especially important if you have uh, two individuals, a married couple who are, who are uh, owning a house. One of them passes away. And let's say that they were using two incomes to pay their mortgage payments. And now the one of them is deceased and the other one needs to move. Well, if you have a will, you can get through the probate courts in about three months, get the property transferred to the surviving spouse, and then they can sell the house or do whatever they're gonna do with it. If they are having to wait a year to a year and a half to get through the probate court to make this happen, those mortgage payments are still due during that time frame. And so what is the surviving spouse going to do? I guess they could go to family members, they could go get a loan, uh, they could file for chapter 13 bankruptcy. Um, all of these things can be avoided if a person has a, a well-drafted last will and testament. So uh, I always start off with that document because most people have heard about it, but maybe they don't understand why it is so important uh, in, in the context of their legal estate planning needs. So 
The second document I want to talk about of, of the five that we tell people that everybody should get uh, is called a disposition of bodily remains document, a disposition of bodily remains. And that is a document that legally allows you to assign who is going to be in charge of your remains when you die. Um, you do not want to have a scenario where you pass away and your loved ones are fighting amongst themselves or disagreeing about what you said you wanted to happen. Uh, did you want to be cremated? Did you want to be buried? Did you want to donate parts of your body to scientific research? Uh, this is a legal document that allows you to make that declaration on paper and appoint somebody of your choosing to ensure that that is carried out. Now, many times we will have people come to us and say, look, we've already prepaid for our funeral. We've got all of that ready. And we don't think that there's going to be somebody in our family. That's not going to be a dispute that we're worried about. In that case, I tell them, well, if, if any of the five documents, if you can get away with not having, that would be the one that you could skip as long as you've done some type of pre-planning and you're, you're confident that your family members are not going to be uh, arguing about it. So, uh, so those are the two documents that, of the five that are important after you die, your will and your disposition of remains. The next document I wanna talk about is important during the time when you are uh, in your last illness. And some people refer to it as a living will. We prefer to call it uh, a directive to physicians. I think when you, when you call it a living will, some people t sometimes will confuse that with a last will and testament. So I call it a physician's directive. And the physician's directive is a legal document that answers the question in your voice at a time when your voice is needed the most. If you are ever on life support, being kept alive by machines, and the doctors do not believe that there's anything more that they can do from you, for you, and they believe that if they were to pull the plug that you would pass away very shortly. Uh, that is a, a crucial question, of course, is should you, be, uh, should you be left on life support, hoping that maybe the doctors have made a mistake or a sec get a second opinion or maybe hoping for a miracle, or would you rather have the doctors pull the plug, keep you physically comfortable with medications and let you pass away uh, naturally. So if you don't have this document, then when that situation uh, occurs, should it occur, the doctor is forced with walking out into the waiting room where your loved ones are waiting and announcing your condition and what likely is going to happen is that the, the people on the left side of the room are going to say, go ahead and pull the plug. And, and your loved ones on the right side of the room are going to say, don't you dare pull the plug. And the people in the back of the room are going to say, I don't want to get involved. And the one voice that is really important in that moment, of course, is yours. If it is your choice to stay plugged in, hoping for a miracle, hoping that, that something changes, um, then your family, uh, is at least going to have the comfort. It's going to be more doctor bills, but your family is going to have the comfort of knowing that that's your choice. Conversely, if your choice is to pull the plug and let you die naturally, you have not put that burden on any of your family members to have to live with saying, oh my gosh, I gave the order to the doctor to you know, pull the plug on my mother. So um, it takes that burden off. The family knows that whatever happened was, was your wishes instead of theirs, and, and it kind of eases the, the transition for them a little bit. So that's document number three, the physician's directive. The other two documents that I want to talk about are documents that are only important and only active legal documents while you are living. And that is the durable, statutory durable power of attorney and the medical power of attorney. Some people call it a healthcare power of attorney. These two documents are, are two sides of the same coin. Uh, they serve a very, very important purpose. And these are two documents that I tell people you should also consider getting at a very early age just because a person's health can, can transform overnight, uh, whether through accident or illness. So starting with the medical power of attorney, 
this is a document that allows you to choose who you want to speak to your doctor and have authority to make decisions medically about you in the event that you can no longer do so. Uh, as long as you have the ability to understand and communicate effectively with your doctor, the law says that you make the decisions for you and nobody else. But there could come a time due to illness, accident, or, or even perhaps you are in the middle of surgery and they, they can't wake you up, where somebody may have to speak on your behalf and make some decisions. So the person that you choose, everybody's got a little circle of people and, and they know who they would trust the most with that uh, type of an important decision. And so this is a way to put that down on paper and give legal authority to the person that you choose. And in this instance, we encourage people to name several backups in succession, because what happens if the person who you've named to be your agent for medical power of attorney is in the car with you when you had the car accident that put you in the hospital so now you can't talk to the doctor. It's good to have several backups on your medical power of attorney so that the doctor can go down uh, a, a list and find somebody with the legal authority to make the decision that could save your life. Uh, th this typically would be used in a situation where a doctor is faced with a, well, do we do the surgery or do we wait? Do we do this type of treatment uh, or a different type of treatment? Uh, again, it's your decision as long as you are able to communicate with your doctor, but in the event that you're not, uh, it's important to have a backup. So the other document is called a statutory durable power of attorney. And this document also allows you to name the individual that you trust to manage your finances in the event that you are not able to do so. Uh, same type of situation where your, your money is yours to spend or save however you choose until you can't do it anymore. Uh, you could also, by the way, um, with a durable power of attorney, you could grant somebody this power immediately to have access to your bank. We sometimes see that with people who uh, maybe they're just at a point in life where they have an adult child who's now paying their bills and uh, taking care of everything for them, you can go ahead and grant that authority to them immediately if you choose to. But the durable power of attorney has, uh, it, it, it's a great responsibility because the individual now has access to all of your money, all of your accounts, and has the ability to move money around. And so we encourage people to, to choose very wisely uh, most people will choose their spouse to be their first choice on that. And then typically it will be uh, maybe a, an adult child to be the second. But we, and we encourage people to have multiple backups, again, to, do, uh, to serve in that capacity if needed. The reason that these two documents are so important, the dura both the durable and the medical power of attorney, is because what happens if an individual does not have those documents and let's say that they, they are going along and then they have a stroke and they are no longer functioning at a level where they could manage their finances and make their medical decisions. If you have these two legal documents in place, you're okay. But if you don't, the real, only real alternative is to, for your loved ones to seek legal guardianship over you. And legal guardianship is, is a, and it's wonderful that it is there for this situation, but it is um, known to be quite time consuming. It is known to be quite expensive. Uh, I'm not a guardianship attorney myself, uh, but I know a few and, and they tell me that it's uh, you know, the, the prices because there are so many court dates involved. You actually have to go to court multiple times to talk to the judge and you know, you're paying legal fees all during that time. And it can stretch out to a year or more to get a guardianship finalized. And even once the guardianship is finalized, then if you want to act as guardian on behalf of the individual, uh, many times you will have to contact your guardianship attorney and go back in front of the judge and say, Your Honor, we'd like to move you know, this money from this account over here to this account over here and seeking the court's permission to do that. And 
So these are the type of things that can be avoided if an individual has uh, a good, durable, and medical power of attorney. Uh, there's no guarantees in the law, but that's one of those 99.99% uh, chance that you would never have to seek guardianship if you do have your powers of attorney in place. So another document, I, I know that there's five documents that we recommend, and those are the basic ones. Again, just to re, uh, recap, uh, a last will and testament, a disposition of remains, a physician's directive, a durable power of attorney, and a medical power of attorney. Those are all the basic documents that we tell everybody that they should have. Uh, one other thing um, with the medical power of attorney, this was pointed out to me several years ago, and I, and I always try to mention it, that um, I said before, the 18, 19 year old crowd probably do not need to be drafting wills and that type of thing uh, just because they don't have the assets to worry about. The medical power of attorney is uh, the exception to that. If you or someone you know has a college student who is over the age of 18 and is going off to college, it's a good idea to remind the parent uh, to get a medical power of attorney for their college age child. And the reason is this, if that college age child were to be in an accident and be placed in the hospital and the parent of course would rush to whatever town that the college was in and go into the hospital and say, tell me about my child. Uh, the doctors, if they were following the law, uh, would say, show me a medical power of attorney. This is, this is, they may be your child, but now that they're 18 or 19 years old, whatever the case may be, they are an adult. And I cannot release information to you unless you have a medical power of attorney over this person. And the time to find out that a doctor is gonna take that position is not when your child is in the emergency room and you're desperately trying to get information. So uh, if you know somebody who has a college age child, uh, at least have them get a medical power of attorney so that you don't run into that situation. Um, but the the, Sixth document, the next one after the original five that I bring up with people, uh, it's a very important document and, and not too many people have heard about it, but it is something, it's called a ladybird deed. A ladybird deed. And uh, it, I'm told, was named after Ladybird Johnson, although I do not believe that she had anything to do with it. Um, a ladybird deed is uh, very useful for anybody who owns real estate. And this could even apply if you own not only your homestead, but also additional uh, real estate, uh, perhaps that you're using as rental property or, or whatever. Um, a ladybird deed can allow a person upon their death to transfer ownership in real estate without having to go through probate and court and all of the other stuff that I talked about with the will. You can transfer real estate uh, very quickly, usually typically within 30 days, because you have to present the, the clerk with a, uh, with a death certificate to prove that the owner actually has passed away. But a ladybird deed is uh, invaluable. Again, particularly if you remember the scenario that I talked about where you have a couple who, who may have a mortgage on a house and one of them passes away and the other one says, oh, I gotta sell this house, I can't afford it anymore. Well, if you have a ladybird deed, you can typically transfer the deceased spouse's uh, ownership within about 30 days, uh, not have to go to court to do it and get the house on the market very quickly so that you don't have to worry about those delinquent mortgage payments or foreclosures or that type of thing. The other thing that ladybird deeds are very useful for we, uh, we, we do help people to, if they're eligible, to obtain uh, some veterans benefits, particularly one called uh, the aid and attendance benefit or pension. And also um, I have a, a wonderful legal assistant who worked in Medicaid for about 20 years. And so we, we help a lot of folks uh, to determine if they are eligible for Medicaid and to actually obtain Medicaid benefits to pay for their care. Um, when, when and if they need 24 hour skilled nursing care. But uh, the ladybird deeds come into play in a very important way when we start Medicaid planning for people because uh, under Medicaid rules, you are allowed to own a house still, 
it is an exempt asset and obtain Medicaid benefits. But what's buried in the fine print is that when you die, if they go to probate your estate, Medicaid can show up under something called the Medicaid Estate Recovery Program or MERP, MERP, and put a lien against your property for the amount of money that Medicaid has paid on your behalf while you were under the Medicaid program. So that's a surprise to many people. Uh, and the way that you can defeat that is to get a ladybird deed uh, on your property and so that your property, uh, your ownership in the property transfers from, from a legal perspective, it's, it's immediate, uh, immediately after you draw your last breath on this earth. Uh, from a practical standpoint, it does take about 30 days because you're waiting on a death certificate. But the Lady Bird deed removes your ownership in that property from your estate prior to you ever going to court uh, for the probate. And since it is removed from your estate, the uh, Medicaid, if they came after uh, some type of reimbursement under the uh, Medicaid estate recovery program, the house is not there for them to put a lien against. And um, this is very intentional in the state of Texas. Uh, Texas passed, uh, the ladybird deeds are what they call common law, which means that the, somebody invented it and it passed the court test over many, many years. The, the legislature also put their version of it into the statute books, into actual law, I believe it was about five years ago, with something called a transfer on death deed. It's just a cousin of a ladybird deed and it's, and it's also in the statute books. So, um, so those, are the, those are the documents that I wanted to uh, talk about in particular. Uh, the other thing that I will mention is that we frequently are asked about trusts uh, there's many different types of trusts that, that can be done. And for an individual who, if they come to us and they say, look, our goal is to be able to pass assets to our children or, or, or loved ones uh, without having to go through the probate process. And privacy and expediency are two primary concerns. Is there a tool that can do that? And the answer is yes. You could get a, what's known as a revocable trust. Uh, some people refer to it as a living trust or a family trust, and it's a way to, again, pass assets very quickly without involving uh, the court. It is a wonderful tool to have until you get to the point where if you are seeking some type of government benefit, such as VA or Medicaid, at that point, the proper tool is something called an irrevocable trust. Um, because what you put into an irrevocable trust, uh, programs like VA and Medicaid, after a certain number of uh, months pass, they will no longer count those assets as being part of your estate. Because as you know, many of the government programs are needs-based programs. And so if you have too much money in the bank, they will say you're ineligible. So, um, so anyway, th those are... Uh, those are the documents that we focus on helping people with. And I, I see that we're, we're getting some questions in here. And Rob, I, I was gonna ask you to jump in. I know you said you were probably gonna have some questions as well. So before we get to the written questions, do, do you have anything? I do. And before I do that though, I'll um, give, give you a chance to catch your breath because this was a lot of information, amazing information, and I know that sometimes it takes folks a moment to digest it just a little bit to start asking their questions. I'm going to show one more very quick video because we want to thank Baylor Scott & White Health for being our presenting sponsor this year for the conference. They have really stepped up to help us not only be able to have the technology to present the conference, but they also provided us with an amazing speaker, one of their uh, infectious disease experts to talk about COVID. So this is a very short video from them as our sponsors. At Bader Sky and White Health, there's nothing more important to us than your well-being. Over the last several weeks, we've done a number of modifications to our emergency room so you can continue to get the care you need when you need it. We're regularly cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces in our lobbies and patient areas. When you arrive, a screener will check your temperature. 
and we're requiring everyone to wear masks. When it comes to registration, we've got a no-touch process. You just answer a few simple questions. We'll get you back to our room as quickly as possible. We want you to be well informed and not ignore symptoms that could indicate a potentially serious condition. In those situations, it's critical you don't delay. To learn more about all we're doing to help keep you safe, visit bswhealth.com slash safety. All right. So we've got some great questions from our folks, uh, but I wanted to ask you a question real quick, Keith. The physician's directive, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the same thing as a do not resuscitate or a uh, DNR? It is not. And, and many people are confused by that. The physician's directive specifically addresses uh, a situation where an individual is being kept alive by machines. Uh, they are on life support, and the doctors have indicated if we pull the plug, this individual is going to die. A, a DNR, or do not resuscitate, is a document that some people will choose to sign. Uh, typically, we will see this if they've been diagnosed with some type of a terminal disease, uh, or maybe they've, they're on their you know, fifth heart attack and, and something. Uh, something is clearly... Uh, they, they've been diagnosed and they don't want to suffer anymore or incur medical expenses. Uh, they've made a determination that look, the next time this happens, just let me go. I've made peace with it. So um, I had an individual uh, one time actually come in who had signed a DNR and this person was 45 years old and in perfect health. And I said, you may want to tear that up because if you were to fall down and hit your head, uh, and have some type of a brain aneurysm that, that the doctors could save you from. But if you had this DNR with you, they, they might take you into the hospital and say, well, this person doesn't want us to save them. Uh, so typically a DNR is one of those, at the end of life, uh, when it, we most often see it when somebody is diagnosed with a terminal condition and they've made the decision that I'm, I'm through fighting. So don't ever sign a DNR until you're, you've made that determination that you're through fighting. Um, with a physician's directive, at the moment that that becomes important, you are flat out on a bed with tubes stuck in you and you're unconscious and you can't speak for yourself. So yeah, very good question. People confuse those documents all the time. Thank you very much for explaining that. Had a question specifically about the DNRs, that's why I brought it up, uh, asking that if an elderly person does have a DNR and develops COVID and is on a ventilator, and a ventilator is recommended, does that go against the DNR? Um, again, the, the DNR, so much with COVID, anytime that we're getting COVID questions right now, uh, the, the probably the proper legal answer is, well, <laughs> Well, if you ask this next year, we'll, we'll have some cases that we can look back on and say, yeah, this is how the courts interpreted things. Um, this, a lot of this is new, but um, so if a person has a DNR, uh, the doctor is, it's, it's notification to the doctor that they don't want to incur all of the treatment and expense and everything else. Uh, would a doctor honor a DNR? If somebody got COVID and they were, they were looking at putting someone on a ventilator, would they withhold the ventilator? My suspicion is that they would probably first sit down with the family and, and talk to the person. Uh, I mean, if, if they could talk to the person who had COVID, obviously they would make the decision about whether or not they wanted to go on a ventilator. Uh, to me, DNR typically is going to be involved an individual who cannot speak to the doctor for one reason or another. Uh, maybe they're they're unconscious or or they're you know uh, so I as I, as I'm thinking about this if a person needed to be on a ventilator I don't believe that that uh, the DNR is going to um, not be honored if it if it is time to make that decision but perhaps the person can still communicate with the doctor you know, at the time of the ventilator and, and, you know, actually tell them face to face, no, I don't want to go on a ventilator. So, so maybe the two, we'll, we'll kind of see how it plays out. But yeah, like I said, the COVID questions, uh, it's one of those check back 
with the legal community in about a year and we can tell you how how that's been interpreted. Right. Uh, another DNR question, do you need to have a separate out of hospital DNR? So does the hospital and the home health DNR, are those actually, or long-term health care, do you need to have two separate ones? Yeah, good question. Um, we have people come into our office from time to time and they, they bring in DNRs or other type documents that they actually obtained in the hospital, uh, the, the most recent hospital they were treated in. And I tell them that's, that's a little bit like house money. Um, if, if you go to a hospital and you don't have a DNR and your doctor says, here, sign this, it's probably going to be a document that they at the hospital or clinic or, or wherever you are, uh, just pull out and you fill in the blanks and give it to them. And my answer from a legal perspective is, well, that document would be honored there because it's their document. Now, would you go down the street to the next hospital over with that document? Are they going to honor it? Who knows if they'll honor it. They may have their own. Uh, so many times people will go to an attorney's office to get just a general uh, legal document that will be accepted at, you know, no matter where they go. Uh, that said, uh, the DNR is not a particularly difficult or complex document. So if you did have a DNR at one hospital and then they transferred you to another one, I, my, my guess is that the second hospital would probably honor it. It's just not that complex of a document. Okay. Uh, got a question about last will and testaments. Is there a part of the will that specifies how your house will go through probate? Uh, you can put it in there. There's, there's something called a specific bequest. Whenever we sit down to do a will for somebody, we will ask them, do you have any specific bequests? Uh, and, and bequest, just a fancy word for gift. Mm -hmm. That uh, do you want to gift your house? Do you want to mention your house in the will? And I would say for the most part, people do not list their house in their will. Uh, by name or, or by location or anything or by legal description, they simply include it as part of what's known as the residual clause, which is um, residual in this context, meaning like everything else. Like you might say, uh, Rob, I might say, uh, I'm gonna give you my cuckoo clock and my lamp and my desk, and then everything else goes to my children. That's the residual clause. So if you don't mention the house, the everything else clause would be your, your house. And the reason many people don't include it specifically in their will is because um, I think society has changed a lot. It used to be people would buy a house and they might live in it for 50 years and then die. Uh, these days, you know, you live in a house five, 10 years and you know, maybe there's people are moving and upgrading and so you don't wanna to have to upgrade your legal documents every time. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, what we see is people just include the house in the residual clause. But if you chose to, you certainly could mention, uh, and in particular, if you wanted to have a scenario where you said, okay, I want my house to go to uh, my wife. And if my wife dies before me, then I want it to be split equally between my children. And if my children predecease me, then I want it to go, you know, a third over here and a third over here. The more uh, detail you want to get into, then you would probably put that in, into your will. And correct me if I'm wrong, with your will, you can, it's not necessarily a fill in the blanks, one size fits all. You can write your will with very specific instructions for very specific things. Absolutely. Now, there, there are some parts of the will. Uh, most attorneys that I know use uh, a, an attorney software. Uh, there's there's th 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 uh, three or four different companies around that most attorneys use. And so some of the uh, language in a will is boilerplate stuff, but the process of putting together a will through that software probably involves, I never counted, but I'm guessing about a hundred different options, a hundred different questions of, you know, click here, click here, and then they'll take you down a different subset of questions. And so the, to answer broadly, are wills tailored specifically toward people's needs? Yes. Uh, we do go through a fairly detailed a uh, series of questions to make sure that the will reflects what a person's true intention is. Got a couple questions here. You had talked about um, updating your documents. How often does someone need to review and update these documents? 
Um, one person is concerned they did them a while ago and they're not sure if they're going to be accepted by the banks and the hospitals. Mm -hmm. So what's your recommendation on how often mm -hmm. to go back, review them, and make updates? The old adage was that you needed to look at reviewing your doc, uh, updating your documents every five years. Um, that is, uh, I would go along with that as far as if you want to have them reviewed, but the law does not change that quickly. Um, the durable power of attorney, more than anything, has changed forms and formats the most over the last 10 years, probably, you know, three or four different formats. Um, but I've seen wills that were drafted in the 1960s that are perfectly good today. Uh, there, there's not some type of a rat, there hasn't been some radical shift where everybody needs to go in and update. What I tell people is if you, first of all, if you change your mind, some people will have a falling out with a loved one and say, I don't want this person to get anything anymore. Yes, you need to come redo your will. Um, the one exception to that is if there is a divorce involved. Many people will say, I leave everything to my spouse, and then later on that marriage ends in divorce. And under the law, the spouse, uh, or now ex-spouse, is simply treated as if they are not mentioned in the will. So they would just skip to the next one. So you do not, just because you have a divorce, you do not have to go update your will. Honestly, the people who come in and do that say, I just don't want to see their name on this document anymore which is also, I guess, understandable. Um, the time to update your will is if you want to change your beneficiaries, the people who are receiving from you, or the people who, who you name to be a, an executor, uh, you'll name this my first choice for executor, second, third, fourth, et cetera. If those individuals start dying, moving out of town, uh, becoming physically unable to do the job, then you may want to come in and update. The other time is um, people might have a will drafted when their children are very young. And then once their children become adults, the children are now natural choices to serve as executors and different roles within the will. That's also a good time to come in and update. Got a question about the living will and whether or not it would prevent doctors from performing special efforts to save your life. Uh, special efforts to save your life. Okay. so. With a, uh, with a living will, also known as a phys physician's directive, uh, the, up until you get to the life support question, the medical power of attorney, or, or pardon me, an individual who can communicate with their doctor is always going to be able to say yes or no to whatever procedure. Now, take the same individual, they're unconscious or unable to communicate uh, with their doctor, perhaps they have uh, very advanced dementia or something. So now their medical power of attorney is going to be the one who legally will make that decision uh, with the doctor together uh, to do whatever type of procedure that may be uh, contemplated at that time. The physician's directive um, really is just to manage and, and handle the situation where a person is unconscious, on life support, and the doctor does not know if the family wants to pull the plug or not. So uh, I, I think that the, the proper answer to that question would be that it would, it would fall more to the medical power of attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time you get to the physician's directive question, uh, the doctors are saying there's nothing more that they could do. With the physician's directive and the do not resuscitate, does that also apply to EMS personnel when we're in an emergency situation? I have, um, I'll tell you my understanding. I, I don't know, uh, I've not spoken to somebody who works on an ambulance and I'm, and I'm actually been very curious about that. So Rob, if you ever talk to somebody who works on an ambulance crew, uh, have them give me a call. I'm very curious about that. I'm assuming that the, I've always taken it that the DNR would be something for a hospital. Uh, if, if I had to just guess, I mean, ambulance personnel are rolling up on a scene and they don't have time to sit and look through documents. My understanding is their job is to try to stabilize the patient to the point where they can get them then to a hospital. So I, I, I don't think that the DNR would come into play 
in, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking more like the car accident type of a situation. If you had an individual who was at their home in bed, had a heart attack and the medics showed up and you know, the spouse said, here's a DNR, that's, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd be curious to know the answer to, of how they would react to that. Maybe we can find that out. We can do a little research on that. Uh, got a question about trusts and uh, wanted to ask about an A, B trust for the husband and wife, whether that would eliminate probate, would it be cheaper than uh, other options? Yeah, an A, B trust is a variation of what, what I was speaking of before with the revocable trust or the living trust, uh, where essentially the uh, the individual, uh, typically it would be a couple, therefore you have A and B, who's going to survive who, A or B, and then the other one uh, takes over. Again, revocable trusts are uh, wonderful tools to have if a person's goal is simply to uh, pass along their assets in a very uh, rapid manner following their death without having to go to court and in a very private way. So uh, there is definitely a place for those trusts and, and they're a wonderful tool to have. The only time that we don't recommend them, I mean, they are more expensive than, than doing, you know, just a will and all that. They're, they're sort of next level up. Um, the only time though that the revocable trusts are not the right tool anymore is when a person starts to seek government benefits such as VA or Medicaid, uh, then we need to talk about doing a, a different type of trust. And would a trust be one that we want to do if we've got a certain amount of assets? Yeah, the, the um, I've seen people do the revocable trust with all different level of assets. Um, really, again, the expediency and the privacy are the two things that, that are attractive. When it comes to the irrevocable trust, um, the way that it works with Medicaid and with VA uh, VA right now has a three-year look back on asset transfers. Medicaid has a five-year look back. So uh, Medicaid, for example, says that an individual who's applying for the Medicaid benefits to pay for their full-skilled nursing, which, uh, you know, could be quite expensive, you know, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000 a month, um, the asset limit, and this is uh, non-exempt assets, for that individual can only be about $2,000. And so if you have a person who maybe they sold their house, you know, add that with their nest egg and their life savings, and they might have four, five, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000 sitting in the bank. And that would make them ineligible for Medicaid just because of, you know, they're, they're well over the $2,000. Uh, people will sell their house as long as they have a house that is exempt. But when they sell their house to go move into assisted living or wherever they're moving to, uh, that pile of cash, Medicaid now says you are uh, not eligible because you've got so much money. So the person is faced with a choice. They can either simply spend their money down until they've only got $2,000 left, which generally is not a very wise financial plan, or they can set up an irrevocable trust, put the money in there, and Hopefully they don't need Medicaid full skilled nursing for at least five years, ideally, because after five years, Medicaid uh, says the money you put in that trust is now invisible to us. We're not going to count that against you. Um, the question that comes up frequently, though, is what happens if I set up an irrevocable trust, I put my money in there, and three years later, I now need full skilled nursing? The answer is... Um, and that's one where I do get my legal assistant VC to actually run the numbers and, and show. But uh, having put the money in the trust already and gotten three years down the road or two years or four years, whatever it is, still benefits because you can still get on to Medicaid. Uh, there will be a penalty to pay because you didn't make it the full five years. But the longer that it's been, the less penalty you're going to have to pay. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple of folks who are with home health care companies here in town that are joining us on the call. And okay. they have said that in reference to the EMS question, oh, yeah. they always recommend that their uh, clients have an out of hospital DNR and that you have it, you know, by the front door. So in the event of an emergency, if you've got 
you know, mom at home and you're often having to call EMS, just have the copy of it and show it to the EMS. So okay. that, is, that is their recommendation. Uh, got a question about the Ladybird deed. Um, what documents do you need to take with you to the attorney in order to obtain a Ladybird deed? Um, when we do a Ladybird deed, uh, I will ask an individual, first of all, who you want to uh, become the new owner of your interest in the house upon your death. And I'll, I need that in the recipient's uh, address, phone number. Uh, we typically can look up the legal description of the house or, or property online. Um, it's not a whole lot of information that we need. Okay. Uh, fairly, and, fairly straightforward document. And uh, also another question asking about the cost to have a Lady Bird deed done. Uh, sure. I know that costs vary depending on individual circumstances, but is there kind of a, a range that people can plan that it's going to cost me this much to get it done? Sure. Um, and, and the range, we, we try to make that as simple as possible. Most everything that we do is on a flat rate. Uh, occasionally if somebody comes in and they've got something that's really over the top and is obviously going to take a lot more work we may we may tell the person look we're gonna have to bump this up a little bit but uh, for the most part uh, it's very quotable uh, as far as pricing goes and we do ladybird deeds for five hundred fifty dollars um, and the one thing that we do tell people is that is per person so if you have a husband and wife and the wife wants to put a ladybird deed on her half and the husband wants to put a ladybird deed on his half, uh, so it's it's you know five fifty per per person. You can't you can't have husband and wife both on a ladybird deed, right? You have to have their own. Let me ask you a question. You know, um, how important is it to have a lawyer be the one creating these forms for you? You know, there are forms on that the state of Texas has that you can download, print off, fill out. But how right. important is it to have actually have a lawyer fill these out for you as opposed to the do-it-yourself? I think it's crucial. Um, I, I do get people who bring their documents in for us to review periodically and I can tell immediately whether it was something that they downloaded off the internet or whether they've got it from an attorney's office. Um, 99 times out of 100 if they got it from an attorney's office my answer to them is going to be your documents are good you're good to go if they have something that they've downloaded off the internet 99 times out of 100 my answer is going to be do you have any idea what these documents say and what they do uh, and what i tell people is that our uh, there's a financial planner that we work with very closely who helps us kind of with people's numbers and, and he's kind of famous for saying you don't know what you don't know and I've always thought of it like this um, unfortunately when I was a teenager my, my father tried to get me to uh, go underneath the hood of a car and learn all about car engines and uh, that type of thing with him and I, I just at the time was not interested so as a result my knowledge of car engines, I've got a little bit, but not like the guys who spent time with that underneath the hood of the car. So um, when I go to my auto mechanic, my auto mechanic could pop the hood and I could probably name a lot of things underneath the hood and what they do, but if he took something out and removed it, I wouldn't know that it was missing. And I'll give you an example. Um, with a last will and testament, it is very important when you name your executor in your last will and testament to use the word independent executor. It's one word, but it can make all the difference in the world because if you don't know how crucial it is to include the word independent executor in the will, you now have about five new hoops that you're gonna have to jump through. You're gonna have to send out a certified letter to each beneficiary under that will uh, asking them to uh, sign a waiver uh, allowing for your your executor to be independent instead of dependent and the di here's the difference an independent executor goes in front of the judge one time uh, for about five minutes with the attorney and then unless there's a complaint against the executor that they've been doing something wrong they never have to go back to court again a dependent executor has to go to court every single time they want to do something so the failure to include that one word in the document has 
it's thousands of dollars of implications because you're paying attorney's fees every time you have to go down to court. So uh, I, I tell people this, technically, if you needed surgery on your arm, you could probably go get something to numb up your arm and get a scalpel and maybe do it yourself. But I don't think you're going to be happy with the results. Uh, I, as an attorney, I cannot tell somebody that it is okay to go online and it's, Legal documents to me are not a do-it-yourself. Uh, get it done right, have your questions answered, and then you don't have to worry about it because many times those legal documents, after you do them, they sit in a drawer or a filing cabinet or something for years and years, and they're forgotten. And then when they're needed and they pulled out, it may be too late to change them. A person uh, could have passed away, their dementia could have gotten worse, so they can't do legal documents any, anymore. Uh, I say take the time, do it right the first time, and then you don't have to worry about it. It's like a lot of the uh, home repair shows on TV always say, spend a little bit of money up front so mm -hmm. that you don't have to spend a whole lot more money later on. Precisely. Mm -hmm. got, a, got another question for you when you're talking about the documents sit in a drawer for a while. When you have a will or the... Uh, medical powers of attorney, uh, all of those pieces done. Are those filed somewhere with the state? Are they in a database somewhere? You talked about the example of both the husband and wife uh, passing away simultaneously in an accident. Where can those documents be accessed or in the event of an emergency at the hospital? Um, okay, couple of different answers. We tell people as far as your last will and testament goes, uh, we, we even put them in a special little envelope that says will so it stands out. When you, when you die, uh, the court is going to ask for your original will. They don't want a copy, they want the original. So we tell people either put it in a safe deposit box or, or maybe a fireproof box at your home. Uh, you can probate a copy of a will, but if you have to probate a copy, the judge's first question is going to be what happened to the original. Prove to me that nobody's altered, you know, that, that this copy matches the original. And there's a lot of new hoops to jump through, which you can interpret hoops as more legal expenses in more time. Um, as far as your medical and durable powers of attorney, uh, the question, of course, is you would take a medical power of attorney to a doctor or a hospital. You would take a durable power of attorney to your bank or maybe your real estate agent. Are they going to require that they see the original? That's an individual question up to each hospital, up to each bank. Um, you definitely want to know where the originals are. Uh, whenever we do documents for people, we give people the original in two copies of all the documents they sign. We keep a physical copy in our, in our folder here at the office, and we also keep a scanned copy. And the scanned copy is particularly important when it comes to a medical power of attorney, because when people leave to go out of, maybe they travel out of state, they don't generally grab their legal documents and stuff them in the suitcase. So if they go up to say Minnesota and they're in an accident and they're in the hospital and they need their medical power of attorney, they don't have it with them. But because we have a scanned copy, they can call our office during regular working hours and we can quickly get a scanned copy up to the hospital or doctor that they need. That's a great point. Yeah, I'm uh, on the paperwork for my parents and I'm serving as their caregiver. And so I have all of their paperwork in a folder right next to the door, ready to run out to meet them at the hospital if needed. That's great. Uh, got a question, speaking of hospitals, um, do you need to have a HIPAA release on file in order for doctors or insurance companies to be able to communicate with a family member? So the HIPAA release, uh, that's one thing that's changed a little bit over the last, I'd say, dozen or so years. Back in the old days, people would do a medical power of attorney, and then the HIPAA release would be a separate document. Uh, more and more attorneys, including our office, are now going to a format where we include the HIPAA release within the medical power of attorney. And for those who maybe don't know, the medical power of attorney lets you choose uh, who's going to make medical decisions for you in the event that you're not able to do so yourself. And the HIPAA release allows the hospital or doctor to turn over your medical records to your medical power of attorney. So if you have a medical power of attorney that does not also include a HIPAA release, essentially 
you're creating a circumstance where the doctor may say, I need you to make a medical decision, but you cannot look at this person's medical records first. You, you just have to go off of what I'm telling you. I can't show you the proof and the charts and all that type of thing. So the modern day, almost every attorney I know who does uh, the medical power of attorney now will include the HIPAA release within that document, just so you're not trying to keep up with two documents. I mean, what if you went to the hospital and you had one and not the other? So uh, they've, they've now combined them into one, one solid document. Excellent. I also had a question, go back to your example of that college student who did not have the power of attorney. In situations like that, who then makes the decision if the student or the person is unable to? So if you had a student who was, say, in a traffic accident and was unconscious and the parent showed up, there's a legal answer and then there's probably a more practical answer. Um, doctors, of course, are all sworn to do no harm and to help in any way that they can. So I think that in reality, the doctor would probably speak with the parents, make a decision, and feel comfortable that the parents were not going to bring a medical malpractice lawsuit against the doctor or hospital for whatever treatment that they chose. Um, that's reality. Now, legally speaking, if you had a doctor who said, I'm not talking to anybody, I'm that worried about a medical malpractice suit, I guess the doctor would just do what they believe was the best course of treatment. Um, but when, yeah, when I say that a medical power of attorney for a college student is important, it may very well be that the parent shows up and doesn't have a medical power of attorney, but they get a sympathetic doctor or maybe a doctor who doesn't actually follow, you know, the letter of the law, they're following, you know, uh, kind of their heart with it, which I'm not, I'm not even critical of that. I would understand that, but you don't want to get in a situation where you show up and this is a doctor who says no policy and the law says if i don't if you don't have a medical power of attorney i can't talk to you because at that moment when you find out the doctor you're dealing with is that way it's too late yeah i've actually heard a story of, of a college student who went to the emergency room that they asked do you have the power of attorney no here fill out this form that she listed her boyfriend mm -hmm. on it. The parents go rushing up the emergency room and the doctors could tell the parents nothing because she had assigned the power of attorney to the boyfriend. Sure. Who they had never met and didn't even know he existed. So, you know, I've, I've heard many law professionals say that as soon as someone turns 18, you should say, here's your birthday card, here's your paperwork, fill it out. That's right. No. Uh, got a question talking about legal documents. Uh, we recently moved to Texas. Welcome to Texas. Do we need to get all new legal documents? Do they transfer state to state? Yeah, good question. We get this one a lot. Uh, most of the states have what they call laws of reciprocity, which means that if you have your legal documents drafted in another state and then you move to Texas and you were to pass away or you needed to implement your, your powers of attorney, that the courts in Texas are going to try to the extent possible to use your old documents. So the, the short answer is no, you don't, you don't have to. Um, however, we, uh, we probated a will not too long ago that was uh, drafted in New York. And the, I'm sure it was perfect under New York law uh, because it's a little bit different than Texas. And the individual moved down to Texas and then passed away. And we went to probate the will and we found out, well, while this is a great will for New York, it doesn't have all of the specifications that Texas law requires. And so here are a whole bunch of hoops that you're going to have to jump through. And it took about two years to get this will probated instead of the, what I usually say, about three to four months. So it, it is at least worth... Um, sitting down um, you know, and, and looking at the documents, maybe especially if they're ones that, that you haven't looked at in a while. Um, we, we happily will sit down with folks and look over their documents and make sure that they understand what it is that they do have in place and, and tell them about the strengths and weaknesses and maybe they wanna make some changes. I had a, a gentleman one time who did not know that 10 years prior to coming in to talk to us, that he had given his brother-in-law immediate power of attorney over his finances. 
uh, and and he he was shocked to find that out. He said that his brother-in-law was not a very reliable person to put in charge of money, and because I guess he didn't understand his legal documents that he had, uh, he was shocked to find out his brother-in-law could have legally gone to the bank and withdrawn all of his money over the last ten years. So we we got his documents changed pretty quickly. So, in a situation like that, let's say that uh, you're caregiving for your family, your family is here, uh, the other sibling lives out of state, but mom and dad have given power of attorney to that sibling 15 years ago. And now you are the one who is here physically taking care of mom and dad on a daily basis. That sibling is out of the picture, isn't even here helping. Mom and dad both now have dementia. Okay. Is there a way of changing that power of attorney in those types of situations and you said that the sibling who lives far away has power of attorney they have the power of attorney but they're not active in the care of the family members and okay. family members now both have dementia so they can't really sure. change it themselves sure uh if they have dementia and they are unable to uh sign legal documents then no you are stuck where you are uh, at the time that we uh, do the signing for documents for individuals, the attorney has to make an assessment about whether or not there, there's actual communication. Um, you, you cannot have somebody sign a legal document that they clearly don't understand. Um, sometimes you may have to have a conversation with them that's on uh, a little gentler level to, to make to, as far as the explanation goes. But yes, with dementia patients, they can clearly reach a stage where they can no longer process the information. And I tell people, you are stuck with the documents that you have. So anytime somebody has a dementia diagnosis, uh, I encourage people, you have a window of opportunity and we don't know how quickly or how slowly that window is gonna close. The only thing that we do know is if enough time goes by, that window is gonna close and then you're gonna be stuck with whatever legal documents that you have in place. So come in and see us and and talk to us and let's get it figured out while we still have the opportunity. Yeah, as we said before, do these things sooner than later because you want to get them taken care of now so you don't run into problems further down the road. Got a question about probate uh, and we've been talking about that it can take quite a while to go through probate. Is there a way to assure a pay upon death with the bank accounts for my spouse? to make sure that the banks don't freeze the assets during probate so that the spouse still has income. Yeah, a lot of people are shocked to find out that they thought that the money that was in their mom's account, uh, that they had, that they'd been actually writing ch mom's uh, checks and paying her bills, and then mom passes away and they go down to the bank and say, uh, okay, release the money to me, and the bank says, no, you have to get letters testamentary. And then they'll call us and say, what are, what's letters testamentary? Letters testamentary is the end result of probate. That's what you're trying to get when you probate a will is the judge signs off um, on a court order that gives you something called letters testamentary. And what I tell people is that while you still have the ability to, especially if you're taking care of an elderly loved one, have the conversation with their bank and say, did you make uh, me, the, the child here, a, uh, a signer on the account or a co-owner of the account. Because if you are a co-owner of the account and, and your loved one passes away, the bank should just release the money to you. There were two owners, now there's one, and that's you. If you are just a signer on the account, then the bank is not going to release that to you until they have a court order. So it is definitely worth a phone call or a quick visit to the bank to say, how, how am I related to this account? And, and I would say even ask them the question, under the terms that we have this account set up right now, if my, my loved one passed away, are you going to require letters testamentary? Are you gonna require that we go through probate and get a court order? Or is this set up where I just show up with my ID and the death certificate and you release the money to me. And then at least you know and can take the steps to get it set up before it's again too late to change that. And now you're finding yourself having to go through a full probate just to get the money in the account. Okay. Um, 
also had a question on whether the survivorship agreement for community property document is similar to a ladybird deed. Survivorship agreement. Okay. Um, for a community property, I'm, I'm trying to determine if you're if you're talking about somebody's homestead, like husband and wife, or are these business partners? Um, is there is there any more specification on the question? There was not. Um, perhaps yeah. the person can give us a little okay. bit. Oh, there we go. Husband and wife. Okay. Um, so the a survivorship uh, clause is works like a contract that you could go enforce in court. Uh, the ladybird deed is a unique. A deed is actually a document that you have drafted and you file with the county clerk. Uh, and, and it's on file at the county clerk's office as a matter of public record. And so um, it's as simple as when one individual passes away and you get a death certificate, which takes about 30 days, you go down to the county clerk's office, prove that the individual passed away, the county clerk's uh, staff pulls it up on their computer, they hit a few buttons on their computer, and then they transfer ownership. So the survival survivorship agreement uh, is more of a concept, and the Lady Bird deed is a tangible document that is on file uh, with the county clerk's office once it is signed and notarized. Okay. Um, got a quick question about the situation where the brother-in-law uh, had the power of attorney and uh, the person didn't realize till 10 years later. How does a financial institution know that there is a new power of attorney? Would you simply just take the new one to the financial institution and say, this one supersedes? Yeah, there's, there's a clause in all of our durable powers of attorney that says uh, that I revoke any previous durable powers of attorney. It's a good idea to take it to your bank uh, where, and, and go ahead and let them put that on file. The bank is going to follow whatever the most recent one is. I should mention, too, in the brother-in-law story, uh, hypothetically, had the brother-in-law gone and tried to do something very self-serving, like drain the individual's bank account, take the money, run off to Las Vegas for a wild weekend, there is a what's known as a fiduciary duty that an agent has when they are serving as someone's power of attorney to do what is in that person's best uh, financial interest. So if the brother-in-law had drained the accounts and gone and spent the money, the, bro the brother-in-law would still be liable for that money. You could take the brother-in-law to court and sue them to get the money back. The question is, would the brother-in-law have the resources to pay this back or not? Kind of guessing that maybe the kind of brother-in-law that would do that probably doesn't have a lot of savings, uh, probably is not uh, the type, you, you could sue them and get a judgment, but it would be an empty judgment that you could never collect on because, uh, as they say, you can't get blood out of a turnip. Right. Uh, got time for two more quick questions. One is, uh, is asking, if you were the co-owner rather than just the signer on a bank account, mm -hmm. would that affect your attempt to prevent commingling of funds for legal purposes? That attempt to prevent your commingling of funds. Um, I think I'm the not, question- I'm not sure that I understand the question. I think the question is the difference between being on the account or being a co-signer on the account. So for example, uh, in my personal position, uh, I am a co-signer on my mother's account, mm -hmm. but uh, we did not set up the account together but in the event of something happening to her, I can sign on her account. Is there a difference between the two legally? Signing on the account and being a co-owner on the account to me, and, and this is one of those that I have to tread lightly because different banks have their own different policies and I hear all kinds of different stories. But my understanding is that with most banks, if you are a co-signer, you have the right to write checks and pay mom's bills and that type of thing, uh, but that money is not legally yours. Uh, and so, you know, if, if mom passes away and you go down to collect it, they're gonna say, no, we're not gonna give it to you without, without a court order, AKA letters testamentary. So uh, again, I always say it's definitely worth 
the time to go talk to your bank and make sure what their policies are. And the big question to ask, again, goes back to the word letters testamentary. Are you going to require letters testamentary when my loved one passes away for me to access this money? And if they say yes, then ask them, well, is there an alternative that we could set up under your policies and guidelines so that you would not require? And they're probably gonna say, if you're named as a co-owner, then you don't have to do that. Okay. And then one last question, we were talking about the uh, durable power of attorney, medical power of attorney. We've also heard recently about a medical, I'm sorry, a mental, power of attorney. Uh, in particular for folks, we talked earlier about uh, if they get a diagnosis of dementia, uh, that it lays out how they want to be treated as their dementia progresses. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we should also add to that list of items that we need? Honestly, that is something I, I have heard recently for the first time about. I don't know if this is something that is new, uh, it is, it's not something that we've, we've dealt with in the past a whole lot. So kind of kind of curious and, and plan to look into it to see if there's maybe something that, uh, you know, new things are invented all the time to address specific problems. Uh, in the past, it has simply been a matter of the medical power of attorney and what type of treatment mm -hmm. uh, that an individual is going to get. If there's, uh, if there's new, a new mental power of attorney, I'm, I'm kind of curious to know what where, where that came from and what it's purporting to do and, and will it be, you know, something that's legal? I don't know. Within the case of someone ha getting a dementia diagnosis, is that something that could be written into that medical power of attorney that says at this certain point, uh, you know, when I can no longer make decisions for myself? Sure. The, that, that already is written into the medical power of attorney. Um, the way that you actually activate a medical power of attorney is with a physician's affidavit uh, okay. stating that according to the doctor's opinion, this individual can no longer make medical decisions for themselves. Yep. All right. As we mentioned at the very beginning, uh, everybody's situation is different and you have individual specifics that are in your own individual case. So it's always best to talk with a legal professional about your specific needs, what's happening in your life, in your family, because it's so much better to have it planned in advance. Make sure that you cover all your bases because God forbid you want to go through probate without a will in the state of Texas. It is not something that's going to be fun and it's going to be very expensive. So Keith, we thank you so, so much for sharing your knowledge, sharing your time with us this morning. We appreciate you very much. We appreciate you at home for joining us today on these sessions. Again, we're gonna send you the links later on, uh, hopefully this afternoon, that will have the YouTube links for all the presentations for this week. And you always remember that you are never alone in your journey here in Central Texas. You have organizations like Age of Central Texas that are here to help you no matter where you are, we can help you connect to professionals like Keith, and they can help you in anything that you need. We thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone at home. We hope you have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you again very soon. Appreciate it, Rob.